Good morning, everyone. I would now invite you to stand to observe a minute's silence as a mark of respect to those affected by the attack in Brussels yesterday. We now move to portfolio questions, and I call question one uh, has been withdrawn. An explanation has pro been provided in the name of Neil Finlay. I call question two in the name of Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports apprenticeships. Minister Annabel Ewing. The Scottish Government's uh, highly successful modern apprenticeship programme is a key element of uh, this government's approach to economic development and to youth employment. We have supported more than 190,000 new apprenticeship opportunities since we came into office in 2007. We are on track to meet our commitment to deliver 30,000 new modern apprenticeship opportunities each year by 2020. And indeed, last month, the Cabinet Secretary for Fair Work, Skills and Training announced that the target for 2016-17 will be 26,000 modern apprenticeship starts. I mean, thanks, Jimmy McGregor. Well, I thank the Minister for that answer, but I have been contacted by representatives of Ardfern Yacht Centre in Argyll, who are keen to take on an apprentice boat builder to train with their experienced team. They have identified the young person keen to fulfil this role, but are experiencing real problems accessing funding support from SDS, as the formal theory parts of the MA are only delivered at three specialist training colleges in the south of England. Will the minister investigate this case and encourage SDS to be as flexible as possible to allow this business to take on an apprentice boat builder? After all, Scotland has a fair reputation for building boats and ships of all classes. Was not Clyde built once a byword for excellence? Thanks. And Will Ewing? Um, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I would also thank uh, Mr McGregor, who I know it's his last uh, question time, or perhaps not quite, maybe there's a few more to come this morning, but for helpfully providing uh, a copy of his supplementary, which he tweeted yesterday. Uh, so that was very helpful uh, indeed. Um, but can I say on, on the serious question that, that uh, Mr McGregor raises, um, I, I will of course be happy to, to look into the specific case uh, that is the first thing to say. Um, SDS are always available to discuss options uh, and uh, that would uh, apply to the member's constituent as it would apply to anybody else seeking to do their best to uh, make young people uh, uh, their business. But I, I do undertake that we will look into the matter uh, to see where matters stand. Um, on the last point that Mr McGregor raised about Clyde Bild, I, I would of course uh, hope that he would be aware that just a couple of weeks ago uh, the announcement by Ferguson's at uh, Port Glasgow of the uh, taking on of 150 new apprentices was very, very good news indeed. And I'm sure Mr McGregor would wish to, to welcome that. Many thanks. As ever, short questions and answers will be appreciated. Question three, Christian Allard. To ask the Scottish Government what training and support it provides to people no longer working in the oil and gas sector. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government fully recognises the severe challenges facing the oil and gas sector at this time and we're doing all we can to support oil and gas workers. The First Minister established the Energy Jobs Task Force which has achieved a great deal since uh, January 2015 including three large PACE events which 
provided direct redundancy support for over 2,500 people. We also recently announced a £12 million transition training fund, which will offer grants to individuals to support their redeployment and help people with the costs of maintaining licences. And we're also providing an extensive network of support through our economic development and skills agencies. Many thanks. Christian Allard. Uh, thanks, the Cabinet Secretary, for the answer. But could you give us more detail on how the training to work in tourism, food and drink and life sciences is accessible for people in order to create a sustainable, diverse economic future for the North East? Secretary. Nobody in the North East are central to driving future growth and prosperity in Scotland, which, of course, is why we've invested so much money in the Aberdeen City Region deal, £125 million uh, from the government. SDS is working with industry on the development and refresh of the skills investment plans with the aim of attracting new entrants into the areas of life science, tourism and food and drink. And SDS are extending this approach to include regional skills investment plans, which will recognise the diverse needs of the regional areas across Scotland, particularly uh, uh, such as the North East. Uh, of course, the successful uh, MA programme uh, also offers young people the opportunity to start a new career and to earn a wage while learning the skills they will need throughout their chosen career. And if the member wants a specific example of some of the work that is happening, uh, I could direct him to the uh, charity Springboard, uh, which is currently working with SDS to deliver a range of initiatives to encourage and support more young people and adults into the hospitality sector and equip them with the skills they need to sustain employment uh, and thrive within it. Uh, Springboard is engaged with eight schools in the area with regard to Future Chef, where all schools have been paired with a mentor chef from industry. Thanks. Um, Lewis MacDonald, briefly, please. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned 2,500 people supported through the three very welcome PACE events held so far under the auspices of the Energy Jobs Task Force. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us how many of those 2,500 people have since secured employment? Sec I don't have the information about how many who have, got, uh, have gone on to secure employment out of that particular 2,500, uh, but many uh, will have, uh, and uh, the fact that not everybody has been able to do that is why we've also introduced the Transition Training Fund, uh, which is a further specific £12 million, uh, which will give direct grants to individuals to support their redeployment. There are opportunities uh, uh, available for people to redeploy and we hope they are able to take them up uh, where possible. Many thanks. Question four, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Developing the Young Workforce programme. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the first Developing the Young Workforce annual report was published in December of 2015. And in terms of the report, it showed that we are making good progress uh, in better preparing young people for the world of work. Key developments to date include expanding work-related skills and qualifications, such as the new foundation apprenticeship, introducing new national standards and guidance for work placements and careers education, offering careers advice earlier in school, and developing closer partnerships between employers and education, with 14 new regional employer groups uh, set up across Scotland. Many thanks. Mike McKenzie. I thank the Minister for that answer. I wonder if she can outline what role businesses in the Highlands and Islands and indeed across the rest of Scotland should play in supporting this programme. Minister. Uh, well, I, I referred in my, my first answer to one of the, the action points, which was the developing of the uh, regional uh, developing young workforce uh, groups. These are industry led. They provide a a, a fundamental bridge between education and business. Uh, they involve local businesses, they build on what was already uh, there. Uh, we will be supporting the setting up of, we aim for 21 regional groups uh, across Scotland. There are 14 to date, uh, including in uh, North Highland, in Murray, in Inverness and Central Highland, and in West Highland. And we hope that all members will rally round these regional groups as they are rolled out across Scotland so that we can all do our best to ensure uh, that we uh, bring on young people and ensure that they are ready for the world of work. Many thanks. Cameron Buchanan, question five. To ask the Scottish Government what training opportunities it offers to people over 25. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, we view Scotland's people as indeed our greatest asset and this government therefore recognises that responding to the skills and training needs of individuals enables them to meet their full potential 
and is indeed a prerequisite of inclusive economic growth. In terms of training support for adults, there is a range of provision available in colleges and universities, in communities and workplaces, and through Skills Development Scotland, our national skills agency, which provides professional careers advice and training support to individuals of all ages. Specific initiatives also include modern apprenticeships uh, for those over aged 25 in key growth sectors, direct support uh, from the SDS Individual Learning Account Programme for low-paid, low-skilled and unemployed individuals, and in-work support via the STUC Scottish Union Learning Programme. Many thanks. Cameron McKinnon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply, but she would be aware that 152,000 college places cut by the Scottish Government has disproportionately affected older learners, and the 2015 Audit Scotland Colleges report shows that there are 41% fewer students over the age of 25 in our colleges than there were in 2008 and 2009. Given that these learners often are often the furthest removed from the labour market and other training opportunities, could she outline what steps the Scottish Government have taken to help people over the, over the age of 25 to access training in Scotland? Minister. Uh, well, on the issue of colleges, of course, we have uh, exceeded our uh, undertaking to maintain uh, full-time equivalent places, and indeed we have seen over 119,000 full-time equivalent places. Uh, we make no bones about focusing on those courses that will lead to progression, to work, to, to further educational opportunities. That is to the benefit of the individuals themselves. In terms of uh, opportunities for the over 25s, I did mention in my first uh, response, presiding officer, the fact that the MA programme is available uh, to support, uh, to provide some support for over 25s in key growth sectors, like, for example, the food and drink sector. 63% of MAs in the food and drink sector are. Uh, with respect to individuals aged 25 plus in digital technologies transition training where we s expect to see in terms of a transition training program to support key skills challenges for ICT digital technologies uh, employers in the Highlands and Islands we expect to see some 40 percent of those individuals will be over the age of 25 in the transition training fund in the oil and gas sector to which the cabinet secretary already referred that will also of course be uh, available to the over 25 so we are uh, uh, determined to ensure that we do the best that we can across the piece for those seeking work uh, and I would say finally to Cameron Buchanan that of course in terms of the devolution of employment support services which we will see shortly sadly those new powers came with effectively an 87% cut uh, from Westminster. But we will do our best to ensure, nonetheless, that we continue to help those who need a bit of help to get into work. Many thanks. Question six, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recommendations in the final report of the Commission on widening access regarding improving skills among the workforce. Cabinet Secretary. The Commission highlights the importance of teachers and early years practitioners being equipped with an understanding of the challenges faced by those from deprived communities and how this impacts on their learning. However, the report does not contain a formal recommendation on this. We have warmly welcomed the report and have moved swiftly to accept a number of key recommendations. We will give careful consideration to the remainder of the report and, if re-elected, we will publish a formal response early in the new Parliament. Thank you very much. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'll be aware that in Recommendation 29, uh, the Silver Report is very clear uh, that it does not uh, think that there's not nearly enough is being done to make best use of the relevant data to track learners at colleges and universities and their progression into the workplace. Data which the report has said could provide much more insightful analysis for upskilling the labour force uh, right across all sectors. Could I ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to address this issue on data? raise this matter directly with my colleague uh, Angela Constance uh, we would always want to uh, ensure that data that was available was being used in the best possible way um, if that is something that comes out of the Commission that uh, we discover has not been happening to best effect uh, then it is likely to be a key uh, issue that will be looked at uh, as I said if we are re-elected and are looking to deliver a formal response hey, thanks does George Adam want the no, next Question 7, Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Fair Work Convention. The Secretary, Rosanna Cunningham. The Fair Work Convention uh, developed and published its Fair Work Framework on 21st March. The framework sets out the Convention's vision that by 2025, people in Scotland will have a world-leading working life where Fair Work drives success, well-being and prosperity for individuals, businesses, organisations and society. 
The framework then sets out what it means by fair work, why it is important, who the main players are in taking this forward and what the challenges are as well. It describes fair work as work that offers effective voice opportunities, security, fulfilment and respect. Thanks. Mark Macdonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer and I welcome the recommendation by the, the Fair Work Convention. Can she uh, highlight how this will now be taken forward in promoting fair work uh, across uh, public and private sector employers to ensure that the recommendation is taken forward and that workers across Scotland can benefit from fair work in the future? Thanks, Cabinet the, Secretary. The Convention has recognised that real progress will only come through businesses, organisations and trade unions working together to deliver change. It, it invites everyone in the workplace to become involved and has challenged itself to proactively support the implementation and evolution of the framework. Um, it will take this forward over the coming weeks and months by engaging with and bringing together stakeholders who have an important role to play in the fair work landscape. And as with the Commission uh, that we discussed in the earlier question, if re-elected to government, we will be providing a formal response in due course. Thanks. Question 8, Murdo Fraser. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to employers in the care sector to help them pay the living wage. As part of the 2016-17 budget, we have taken action to protect and grow our social care services and deliver our shared priorities by investing a further £250 million in health and social care partnerships. Part of this investment is to enable local authorities to pay a living wage to care workers supporting vulnerable adults, including in the independent and third sector. It's an ambitious com uh, commitment which we are currently working through with providers and councils. There has been a series of meetings to discuss this investment and we will continue to work in partnership with stakeholders between now and October to ensure effective implementation. Thanks. Marta Fraser. Can I, th I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. I know that the additional money she talked about has been welcomed by many uh, in the sector, but also there are still concerns that, for example, the issue of differentials is not being addressed by the money that's coming in. And given that the care sector is, is perhaps unusual in that so much of its income comes directly from public funds and therefore there's very little scope to raise additional funds uh, from other sources, and therefore the living wage of its paid has to come really from that source, will the Scottish Government um, well, whoever might be in the Scottish Government after the election, uh, agree that it needs to sit down and continue to work with employers to make sure the funds coming in are sufficient to meet this ambition of that all workers will get the living wage. Um, Murta Fraser is correct to say that the uh, partnership working has to continue and is absolutely vital if this is going to work. Um, I would direct him to the fact that there are actually five care companies who are accredited living wage employers uh, and working in the adult care sector, so it is worth flagging up that it is possible uh, for care companies to be already paying uh, the living wage. Um, in the integration authorities, the integration joint boards who are key to taking this forward will direct local authorities to commission care from the independent and voluntary sectors on the basis that people will be paid £8.25 an hour, uh, giving thousands of care workers a pay rise. Um, we would have preferred implementation earlier than 1st of October, but we've uh, allowed that extra time to allow COSLA to do the preparatory work that is going to be required and, you know, uh, precisely the kind of work that Murdo Fraser is referring to. But the main beneficiaries of this will be care workers in both care homes and home care services provided by independent and voluntary sector providers. Um, uh, and uh, I would hope that everybody in this chamber welcomed that. Thanks. Question nine, James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve the pay of workers in the hospitality sector. Mr Annabel Ewing. Um, although the Scottish Government is not able to set pay levels in the third and private sectors or indeed the wider public sector in Scotland where employees are not covered by our pay policy, we do encourage every organisation, regardless of size or sector, to ensure all staff receive a fair level of pay and where possible to pay the living wage. Indeed, Research suggests that the living wage can enhance productivity, reduce absenteeism and improve staff morale. And those are key advantages for an industry such as hospitality that recognises excellent customer service impacts favourably on the bottom line. Yeah, James Kelly. Thank the Minister for the answer. Does the Minister agree that it remains a challenge payment of the living wage in the hospitality and retail sectors? Indeed, Greggs, who have a base in my constituency, have expressed opposition to payment of the living wage. And can I therefore ask what action uh, the Scottish Government is, is taking 
to enforce payment of the living wage in the hospitality and retail sectors with companies with whom they have contractual arrangements with? Briefly, please, Minister. Um, well, I, I hear what the, the member says, and I would encourage every member to take the opportunity uh, in their constituencies to uh, work with uh, local employers of whatever kind to uh, encourage them to pay uh, the living wage. Um, in terms of the example that the member raises, uh, I am not aware of the particular circumstances, but I am not also aware that the government has any particular contractual relationship with that particular company. Uh, in broad brush, of course, if this parliament had powers over uh, the minimum wage, uh, which, of course, the Members' Party did not, seek, did not seek in the Smith Commission, then we would be in a much better position, presiding officer, to enforce payment of a decent wage for our workers in Scotland. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions on fair work, skills and training. And we now move to portfolio questions on social justice, communities and pensioners' rights. Question one, Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it will increase affordable housing supply in East Kilbride. Minister Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government works closely with the housing providers throughout South Lanarkshire to increase the supply of affordable housing. In East Kilbride, 238 new affordable homes were built between 2011-12 and 2014-15. We expect to see a further 72 new homes completed in the town by the 31st of March 2016. Another 191 new homes are currently on site and due to complete by 31st March 2017. And land has recently been acquired by a housing association with Scottish Government grant to provide a further 34 new affordable homes. Many thanks, Linda Fabiani. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? And the Minister will be aware that East Kilbride suffers a particularly acute social housing shortage, in some measure due to the aggressive right to buy policy that was historically applied when it was a new town. Uh, the, cover, the current government's record in affordable housing is certainly way beyond that of the previous administration. But will the Minister confirm that if this government is returned post-election, particular discussion will take place on East Kilbride's social housing provision? Minister. Uh, I can certainly um, say to, to, to the member that the government would be willing to, if uh, re-elected, willing to discuss with her and with South Lanarkshire Council their um, plans for affordable housing in um, East Kilbride. But I can say that we have increased the resource planning assumption for South Lanarkshire from £10.16 million in 2015-16 to £16.938 million to 2016-17. And that's a 66% increase in committed funding. And that's in spite of the constraints of the UK budget cuts. Many thanks. Question two, Drew Smith. Uh, thank you, President Officer. May I ask the Scottish Government what policies it has instigated to achieve uh, greater equity between the most and least wealthy parts of the country? Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, our commitment to tackling inequality and poverty across Scotland is made clear in the 2015 programme for government, and we have instigated a number of policies to achieve a greater degree of equality across the country in our time in office, including a commitment to support people in Scotland affected by the UK government's welfare cuts. The First Minister appointed an independent advisor on poverty and inequality who has published a series of recommendations in a report shifting the curve. We also launched a nationwide discussion last year asking people across the country what a fairer Scotland means to them and a report on the findings was published recently. Thanks. Drew Smith. I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for his response um, and I would certainly welcome many of the initiatives, particularly in welfare, that he highlights. Um, however, I must congratulate him on getting through that answer without once mentioning the word redistribution. Um, I heard Scotland recently uh, described as becoming the best place in the world to be middle class. Does he not agree with me that when Cosley yesterday said, uh, produced a manifesto claiming that Scotland's inequalities are in danger of overtaking countries uh, with which we would not want to be compared. Uh, and I think the poverty adviser uh, who advises the First Minister has said uh, something similar too. Isn't the real challenge in the next Scottish Parliament for the rhetoric on inequality to actually turn into action? Cabinet Secretary. Pre Presiding Officer, this government is taking action across a range of fronts. First of all, we've got the highest level of employment uh, in any part of the United Kingdom. Secondly, we are extending the living wage as much as we can 
Thirdly, we have improved the social wage. And fourthly, we will use our new powers on social security to maximise equality and reduce poverty in Scotland. And uh, can I finally, presiding officer, wish the member all the best as he's not returning to the parliament and uh, look forward to working with him in some new capacity in the near future. Many thanks. Alex Johnson, brief supplementary, please. Would the minister undertake to assure us that rather than concentrate exclusively on the redistribution of wealth through taxation, that he will actually do something to improve labour mobility in Scotland so that Scotland's unemployed can actually move to the areas where the new jobs are created and take up the opportunities that George Osborne has generated through his economic growth? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Presiding Officer, I think the, uh, in the next six weeks what the Scottish electorate will be saying to the Scottish Tories is get on your bike uh, because uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this government is doing everything it possibly can which is why we've got the highest level of employment uh, ratio of any part of the United Kingdom and if we weren't burdened by the UK government's rather uh, hideous policies we could do much much more for the people of Scotland. Thank Thanks. Question three Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports anti-poverty initiatives in Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, we fund a number of organisations to deliver anti-poverty initiatives in Glasgow. This includes advice services delivered by Macmillan, the Citizens Advice Network and One Parent Family Scotland and a range of initiatives with the likes of Glasgow Disability Alliance, the Alliance, Fair Shares, Glasgow City Council and Glasgow Council for the Voluntary Sector aimed at helping those affected by poverty and welfare reform. Thanks, Bob Donis. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? And can I say that I very much hope the new maternity and early years allowance being rolled out by the Scottish Government will help some of the poorest families in the communities that I represent in Glasgow region. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary for some more details in relation to the rollout of that new allowance and how many are likely to benefit in the city of Glasgow? Signing officer, for a family with two children, the maternity and early years allowance means £1,900 worth of support over the period of their early years, compared to £500 that is available now. The payment at birth for a first child will increase from £500 under the Sure Start Maternity Grant to £600, and reversing the UK coalition government decision to restrict payments to the first child, we will introduce a £300 payment for second and subsequent children. But we also recognise that the disadvantages of poverty affect children not just at birth, but at other key stages of their young lives. We will therefore make payments of £250 to support families through the transition when children start nursery and again and again at the start of school. This is an example of the fairer social security system we want to achieve in Scotland and where we are redistributing resources in favour of the most vulnerable members of our society. Many thanks. Briefly, Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I had thought Mr Doris might declare an interest given the recent uh, happy birth of his young son Cameron. So congratulations to Mr and Mrs Doris on that. But I wonder if the uh, Cabinet Secretary would acknowledge that the good work that Glasgow City Council does in tackling poverty in the city is going to be vastly affected by the cut of some £130 million as a result of his government's funding settlement to that city. Absolutely. Officer, uh, the overall cut to the local government budget is less than 1% of the total revenue expenditure after taking account of the additional money being put into social care. So there will be no excuse for Labour-controlled Glasgow City Council to make Glasgow a less fair city than it is. Hey, thanks. Uh, question for me, Scanlon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it complies with its social justice policy objectives for self-funding older people in residential care to pay more than local authorities for the same care. Say. Presiding officer, free personal care is available for everyone aged 65 and over in Scotland who have been assessed by the local authority as needing it. Free nursing care is available for people of any age who have been assessed as requiring nursing care services. We are committed to ensuring those in the lowest incomes or with the lowest asset wealth continue to receive financial support from the local authorities for their residential care. Two thirds of people in residential care, around 24,000 people, are supported in this way in Scotland. 
the Scottish Government and the Royal Commission on Long-Term Care have been clear that those who can afford to pay for their care should continue to do so while we support those who cannot afford to pay for theirs. Scanlon. Thank you. Can I thank David McLaren in the chamber desk for randomly selecting me for this question, given that I've, I've been complaining about not being selected for the past year. <laughs> uh, question is? Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary uh, how it can be socially just when councils pay about £470 a week for a placement in a care home, but a self-funding placement costs well over a thousand? And can I just in my final question say that I've been asking this question uh, since 1999. The Labour Party's response used to refer to a 1951 Act of Parliament which forbade them from applying charges equally. So with the huge raft of powers, being devolved to this Parliament, can I ask if the Government will commit to reviewing this situation to bring fairness and social justice for all elderly people? Cabinet Secretary. Presi Presiding Officer, having heard the supplementary, I'm absolutely sure that it was not a random pick uh, for uh, Mary Scanlon to ask that question because she's campaigned on this issue vigorously uh, ever since 1999. And can I draw her attention to the joint review of residential care services between the Scottish Government and COSLA published about 18 months ago, where that was amongst a number of issues that we intend to try to address. And can I finally, Presiding Officer, since this is Mary Scanlon's last question, just pay tribute to Mary's tremendous service to this Parliament and to the country, and particularly to the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. She will be sorely missed from this Parliament. Many thanks. Question five, David Stewart. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing to communities in the Highlands and Islands. Minister Marco Biaggi. The Scottish Government and its public sector partners continue to make significant investment in our communities, including the Highlands and Islands. For example, yesterday we announced a £315 million Inverness and Highlands City Region deal, including a Scottish Government commitment of up to £135 million over 10 years. The deal, which also includes up to £53 million from UK Government and up to £127 million from the Highland Council and its regional partners, contains a package of measures aimed at improving the regional economy. These include better transport connectivity and digital networks, increases in innovation, more local housing and assisted living schemes. Many thanks. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, communities across the Highlands and Islands are on the front line of council cuts. In my home area, the Highland Council has made cuts of £30 million with 341 staff facing redundancy. Is the Minister aware that in the Highlands, bereaved families face rocketing burial charges with over 50% increase, bringing funeral poverty to regions most vulnerable at time of acute grief? The Council leader places responsibility for the cuts squarely at the door of the Scottish Government settlement. Does the Minister agree? Yes, sir. Uh, Highland Council is receiving £439 million from the Scottish Government and as uh, my colleague the Cabinet Secretary has already said, the overall reduction nationally for local government is 1% when the figures for uh, uh, health and social care are taken into account. That money is going to achieve the living wage for health and social care staff, a further freeze on council tax bills. It is going to deliver great advantages for the whole of the country. There are clearly challenges that each local authority is going to have to address uh, to decide how they want to deal with the financial circumstances. Those are the same financial circumstances and the same challenges that have been striking the entire public sector. On the issue of funeral poverty in particular, the member will be aware of the work that has been done between the Scottish Government and uh, Citizens Advice, which was uh, launched by the Cabinet Secretary uh, relatively recently, and uh, we will be taking action forward from that. Many thanks. Question six, Graham Day. Thank you to ask the Scottish Government how many homes have been built per head of population since 2007. Minister Margaret Burgess. Under this gov Government, over the 2007-2008 to 2014-15 period, an average of 336 new homes per 100,000 population have been built in Scotland per year across all tenures. Many thanks. Graham Day. Thank the Minister for that response. I wonder if she can, I can ask her how that figure compares to England and Wales. I uh, can Minister say Margaret to the Burgess. Member that house building, and I have said it in a number of occasions here, that house building in Scotland has been consistently higher in each and every year since 2007. 
The 336 homes built per 100,000 population in Scotland compare with 237 built per 100,000 population in England and 2,007 homes per 100,000 population in Wales. And in percentage terms, it means that over the 2007 to 8 period uh, to 14-15 period, building in Scotland is 42% higher than in England and 62% higher than in Wales. Thanks. Question 7, Richard Lyle. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the People and Community Fund and how it supports community organisations. Minister, market budgets. On Monday, I announced a budget of £10.755 million for the People and Communities Fund in 2016-17, which will support nearly 190 continuing community-led People and Community Funds projects throughout Scotland with a further year of funding. An evaluation of the People and Communities Fund will be conducted in 2016 to explore its impact and to understand better how this type of funding supports and empowers communities. Thank you, Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Minister uh, for her answer and can I welcome the update on the People and Communities Fund. Can I ask the Minister what advice could be given to possibly help a local Belsall group in my region who require funding for a traffic report requested by North Lancashire Council to establish a sports hub, therefore ensuring that this project can gain the best for their local area. Minister. Okay. Uh, what I can say to members is the government, this government recognises the importance of funding for our community groups to help empower them to deliver the local priorities that matter to them most. That's why, despite a tight spending review, we maintained a £20 million commitment to the family of empowering community funds in 2016-17. And local authorities also have a key role uh, to play as a partner in community groups to help them realise their local ambitions. And I would encourage all community groups to use the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations helpful funding portal that can be accessed at www.fundingscotland.com to help identify funds available in Scotland for their activities and wish uh, the local group and the members constituency luck in, luck in facilitating this new enterprise in Bells Hill. Thanks. Question 8, Anne McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on introducing a time limit for temporary accommodation. Minister Margaret Burgess. Time limits already exist for the use of unsuitable accommodation yes. for families with children and pregnant women. The provision of temporary accommodation is an important part of the local authorities' duties for homeless households in Scotland and provides a vital safety net for those that require it. Time spent in temporary accommodation should be as short as possible while suitable, sustainable, settled accommodation is found. Moving households through temporary accommodation as quickly as possible should be balanced with a person-centred approach which considers the particular needs and housing op options of individual households. Thanks. And McTaggart. Thank you, Minister. Um, local authorities report significant increases in the length of time spent in temporary accommodation. Typical stays in temporary accommodation are now over seven months, and some people it can be up to two years. Will the Cabinet Secretary support a reduction in the length of time homeless people have to spend in unsuitable temporary accommodations to 14 days, and also extend provisions on standards in the Homeless Persons Order 2004 to include single homeless people and families without children? Minister. What I would say to the member is that we're continually reviewing um, temporary accommodation and the use of temporary accommodation for all homeless people. And from the end of this month, March 2016, local authorities will begin a mandatory collection of information on length of time spent in temporary accommodation. And this will help inform the Scottish Government in consultation with our stakeholders about any further steps that it may need to take. But what I would say is what I said at the beginning, the length of temporary accommodation eh, for anyone should be as short as possible. Many thanks. Question 9, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it is given to strengthening community councils. Minister Marco Biaggi. Uh, although local authorities have statutory oversight of community councils, the Government has been working with COSLA, the Improvement Service and Edinburgh Napier University to further enhance their role. John Mason. I thank the Minister for that answer. I wonder if he shares my concern that as we want to push power down to local communities below the city council level, it is difficult when many community councils are not active, or if they are active, they really only are kept going by a very small band of people. 
Minister. Uh, I, I do share that concern. And community councils that don't feel listened to will not attract people. They will struggle to recruit. Um, our work includes uh, a website to support uh, community councils, digital engagement workshops to support them in recruiting new people and uh, hosting a Fairer Scotland Community Council event to which all community councils were invited. Last year I also met the National Body for English Parish and Town Councils to learn more about uh, their system. I would describe myself as actively interested but any further work would be for the next administration to take forward of which I will clearly not be a part. <laughs> Thank you. We now move to general questions. Question number one, Gord MacDonald.